Uh, Psalms 24, my subject matter this morning is who is God, and uh, I, we're not going to cover that subject matter this morning, do <laughs> you understand that? That's, uh, that's why we gather all the time is we're endeavoring to know more about him and, and who he is, but we are going to study a, a specific aspect of who he is this morning. So Psalms 24, starting in the first verse, it says, the earth is the Lord in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has found it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. God bless the reading of his word. Amen? Amen. You know, one of the best ways that... Uh, uh, to know who the Lord Almighty is, is to know him by his names, for it's through his names that he reveals to us who he is, his nature, his will, and the various ways he is actively working in his world today and working in our lives individually. The names of God are perfect expressions of himself. So for this morning's message, we're going to look at the seven compound redemptive names of God that begin with the title of Jehovah. The name Jehovah is God's name as it was revealed in his covenant to the nation of Israel. It is not only redemptive, it is also relational. The name Jehovah means the eternal, self-existent, and unchanging God. There is none likened unto him, none that we can compare unto him. And to give you some other supportive scriptures that verify this, in Malachi 3, 6, the Lord revealed himself and said, I am the Lord, I change not. And then in James 1, 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. And of course, we know Hebrews 13, 8 declares that Jesus Christ, who we believe is God manifested in the flesh, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so throughout uh, Scripture, God at appointed times and for specific reasons revealed his name to his people. And this was so his people could gain assurance and have faith and confidence of who the Lord was so they could interact with him accordingly. And when we know who the Lord is, we can interact with him accordingly also and it produces faith in our heart. That faith gives us assurance not to run from God, but to run to him. So God reveals himself through his names. His name reveal his nature. His nature, therefore, gives us assurance and peace and confidence to be able to come to him and to receive from his hand. Because the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. So since the Lord is unchanging, this means he never ceases to do what he has already done. If he did it before, Scripture says, he will do it again. And as we learn about these names and how they apply to us today, I believe that we will gain great faith. And in gaining great faith, I believe we will draw closer to the Lord. And our hearts are filled with assurance. Um, one of the things that, that most parents recognize uh, with their children is when they take them to new places uh, and they're around a bunch of unfamiliar people, they uh, aren't very comfortable. They're not at ease. And they, they stay close, hopefully, to mom and dad and, and don't wander too far off. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, Charlene and I have, uh, you know, sort of lived out in pastoring is that there's, there's, there's times where we don't see our family for six months at a time. Uh, there was 
you know, a, a time where it was just maybe once a year that we saw our family because they lived uh, apart from us and we lived, you know, apart from them. And when we would take Luke, uh, you know, to their homes, uh, he really wasn't comfortable or familiar with them. And, and because of this, you know, he didn't really just jump into his grandparents' arms or didn't buddy up to his cousins or his aunts and uncles. It, it took a little while for him to warm up to them. But the longer that we were with them, then the more comfortable he became. And he would, you know, step out and do something with his grandparents apart from us. He would go play with his cousins. He'd interact with his aunts and uncles. And, and, but it took a little time for him to be at ease. And I, I think there's a lot of believers that have an awareness of, of maybe who the Lord is because somebody else shared this is the Lord and I want to share with you who he is. But they haven't personally spent enough time with him to know him in that way. So this isn't a study where we're just trying to gain an understanding of who God is. I want it to be something that when we know who God is, we become more comfortable in coming closer to him. That we're more at ease, we're more at peace. And so today... As we look at these various names, that's my prayer for us. Let's dive right in. The first is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is the Lord will provide. Now, this was a, a time in Scripture in Genesis chapter 22 where, uh, where there was a, an offering that was being presented before the Lord. And it was the story of Abraham and, and Isaac. And he was taking his son up to be sacrificed uh, on the mount. And uh, he was getting ready to draw the knife and to sacrifice his son, and the Lord revealed a ram in the thicket. And that ram in the thicket was a redemptive act of God, and God said, I want you to take the ram, sacrifice the ram, which is a type of, of Jesus being sacrificed for us. And he said, I am the Lord, I will provide. It was the first time that God revealed himself as Jehovah. And it was at a moment that all of us are sort of <gasps> gasping for breath. Would Abraham actually sacrifice Isaac? And yet the Lord provided a ram in the thicket provided a perfect sacrifice, and then said to Abraham, I am Jehovah Jireh. I will be your provider. That brought assurance and comfort, confidence and faith to Abraham that going forward, he could rely and trust in the Lord in every season and in every circumstance that God would provide, that he would make a way for him and his faith increased. Now, in the New Testament... Paul writes to the church in Philippians 4.19, and most of us know this verse by heart, and it says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So let me remind you that Jehovah God in the Old Testament is revealed in Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus in the New Testament. Because when you talk about the Trinity, you talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the blessed three in one. Each and every one of them could complete one another's sentences. They are one in purpose and in the redemptive work to bring man back into themselves. And each of them played a various and different role and each had a different part to play in redemption but they're all in agreement and in unity about redemption. So Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, and through Christ, all of our needs are met according to his riches and glory. And it, it, it brings comfort and consolation, so no matter what your need might be, a physical need, emotional, relational, it could be you know any number of things, God supplies those needs. He's still Jehovah Jireh. He's still the one who provides. This is one of the ways that God reveals himself unto us. The second one is Jehovah Nisi. He is the Lord, our banner. In Exodus chapter 17, 
This is when the nation of Israel and Moses were in a battle with the Amalekites. And in the midst of this battle, the strategy was this, that as long as Aaron and Hur lifted up Moses' hands, then the people of God prevailed. And the Lord covered them, and he was their banner. As they lifted up Moses' hands, the Lord surrounded his people, covered his people, was a banner over his people, protected his people, fought with his people, and, pro, and, and did great things for them, brought victory unto his people. And, and so whenever his hands, Moses' hands, became weary and began to, you know, lower, then it would seem like the Amalekites would get the advantage. But, you know, when we lift up our hands, then we're saying, Lord, you're our banner. You're our covering. You're the one that, that fights our enemies for us and that we can allow you to be a part of our life just by acknowledging you through the lifting of our hands, through the submission of our heart, through the willingness to invite you into our problems and allow you to fight with us against our enemies. And we know when we lower our hands, which is a, a representation of maybe getting our eyes off the Lord or growing weary and doing good or getting tired or, or you know, getting exasperated, that there's other believers that can come along beside us and help lift up our hands and lift up our countenance and encourage us once again, and the Lord will be glorified and fight, and we will get the victory. So in John's Gospel, chapter 15, it's a beautiful picture of the analogy of the Lord being the vine and we being the branches. And, and thank God that Jesus has grafted us in to the family, and the Lord now is our covering. He's our banner. And, and in the Hebrew Septuagint, which is, which is how you sort of a fancy way of saying how do you transpose Hebrew into Greek, and what it says is that the Lord is our banner, and his banner over us is love. The expression of God over us his banner over us, what covers us, is love. And he is still Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. All right, number three, Jehovah Rapha. We're getting to know who the Lord is. Now let me pause here for a moment, and let's just have some interaction. How many of you can name one of the attributes of God that are near and dear to you? Just give me three or four. Just start naming out who is the Lord. He's a healer. He's a protector. He's a comforter. He's a provider. God is, let's finish the question. God is, let's fill in the blank. God is what? God is love. All right, give me another attribute of God. God is what? God is holy. Come on, some of you, open up. God is merciful. Some of the people in the balcony, God is? For God is forgiving. How about God is faithful? God is just. God is patient. God is kind. So when we talk about who God is, you can see all of those are a message. But how do we know God is all of those things? We know that because of his names and because of the ways that he's interacted redemptively with mankind when they had challenges, problems, difficulties, battles. Situations that they couldn't change. It's, it's true that we need to come to the Lord and just worship him, but you can also come to the Lord and download and unburden yourself from all the things that are trying to weigh you down. His shoulders are still sufficient enough to carry all of the weights that he doesn't want us to carry. We can still yoke up with him and he'll still be the one who, who sort of shoulders the heavier burdens or the heavier issues in life. If you know the Lord in that way, then it helps you and it helps me to draw closer to him. If you know the Lord is merciful because why? Your sins have been forgiven. If you know God is faithful because he has proven himself to be steadfast in your life. If you know that God is forgiven, uh, a forgiving God because he cleanses you from all unrighteousness, then 
you're likely to go to him when you need forgiveness. If you know God is a God of favor, when you're going in for an interview or potentially uh, looking for a promotion, you don't have to do that by yourself. You can actually partner with the one who is with you always and say, thank you, Lord, that you surround me with favor as with a shield. If you know the Lord in those ways, then you can draw close to him. You can have assurance. You can have confidence. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And so God wanting us to know who he is at various times in various ways and for very specific reasons revealed himself to humanity. And he's the same. So we know that he still these he still behaves in these ways towards us. Jehovah Rapha is the Lord our physician. We took a look at this last week for a moment and in the wilderness the people of God you know, began to grumble and complain, and they were bitter, and, and God turned their bitterness into sweetness. And in James chapter 5, we're reminded, if there's any sick among us, let us call for the elders of the church, and they can anoint them with oil, pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord will raise them up. And this is a, another demonstration that the Lord still is interested in us and our physical health, and he wants to be the Lord who heals us. So as we know his name, we know his nature, we know his will, and we begin to understand his ways. And his ways are different than our ways. And they require faith. They require humility and submission. To call for the elders of the church shows a sign of trust and dependency upon the Lord that I'm going to believe that as I step out in faith on your word that you're going to make it good because you're the Lord and you are the Lord, my physician. You're Jehovah Rapha. Number four, Jehovah Shalom. God is our peace. The fourth way that God revealed himself unto his people is a season in which Gideon, who was, uh, you know, a, a part of uh, the smallest tribe of the nation of Israel, was getting ready to fight uh, the Midianites. And the Lord was looking for someone to lead the charge, and, and no one was stepping forward. They were all sort of, you know, uh, had, it's, it's not untypical, is it, of, of mankind. If, if someone asks for a volunteer, uh, that, that people uh, most of the time are somewhat reluctant, put their head down, say don't make eye contact with whoever's asking for help, and they won't, you know, ask you to come. So it was no different for them. God was looking, his eyes were looking to and fro throughout the whole earth for, for someone who would be willing to be that, that vessel that he could use. And, and since no one stepped up, he went and located Gideon. Gideon was in hiding and, and, uh, and, and the Lord showed up in, in, uh, through the representation of an angel. And an angel says, hey, mighty man of valor. And there he is about to wet his pants and, and just, you know, just, just, uh, uh, and he said, you've got the wrong person. Uh, I didn't, uh, how'd you find me? Uh, I thought, well, we, we, there's a whole nother subject matter, but we just can't run from God. We can't hide from him. If he wants to use each and every one of us. So hide as you may, he can, you know, shine a light in our, in our darkness. And, and he comes and, and, you know, Gideon and the angel begin to, to have a conversation, and, and then once the angel leaves, you know, Gideon came uh, to understand through this angel's message, this truth, God is our peace. Uh, I believe the reason that sometimes we don't step forward is, is we, lack, we lack peace. We're more mindful we're, of, of maybe the failures that may occur or we're more fearful of, of the rejection that may, we may encounter and so we don't really step up. But when you know that God is, is your peace, then the fears dissipate and the concerns are sort of put on the curb and, because God has provided peace and that peace swallowed up the fear and the insecurities and the doubts, the unbeliefs that we wrestle with as people, correct? Yeah. So here Gideon was fearful and afraid, and God said, hey, through this angel and the message of this angel, uh, you're, you're going to win this victory, and God's going to get the glory. 
And all of that did come to pass. But the reason that it happened is because Gideon had a revelation, and I hope you get this revelation, that no matter what God asks you to do, what the assignment, you're not doing it by yourself. The God of peace will be with you. The God of peace goes before you. He surrounds you. He'll keep you. And even though the odds may be stacked against you, you and God are still a majority. Who is greater than you and God? You and God together are greater than any enemy, any foe that you may face. In Ephesians chapter 2, a beautiful portion of Scripture, it just talks about that Jesus is our peace. That he broke down the middle wall or the partition that separated us from God. And now we have been brought into his fellowship, brought into his family. So those are the first four names. The fifth name is Je Jehovah Raha, or, and it's the Lord our shepherd. We're very familiar with the 23rd Psalm, but have you personalized that Psalm in your life? Have you opened up with the beginning stanza in the first verse and said, Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. That was David's testimony because that was David's reality. That's what he had experienced. That was his reality, that, that he, he was a shepherd unto him. So David knew his role was to follow the shepherd, to be under the shepherd's care, to stay close to the shepherd, close enough to hear his voice, and... Then in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the great shepherd. This great shepherd that was revealed through John's writing in his gospel. If you haven't gone back and read John chapter 10 recently, can I encourage you to do so today? Because as you read John chapter 10, it, it states all the qualities of a good shepherd. All of the things that cause us to be happy, fat, and fruitful sheep. We have a shepherd in this life. And in the fields that God leads us to, there's always going to be water, there's always going to be grass, there's always going to be protection because he's our shepherd. He recognizes when the enemy shows up, those times where that crafty, deceitful, plotting ways of the enemy shows up and he disguises himself as a sheep, but he's really a wolf. He's just wearing sheep's clothing. That his rod and his staff, they comfort us. That he draws us close with his staff and he takes the rod and he drives back our adversaries, our enemies. That the God of heaven and earth, the God of all creation, the God who was and is and is to come, God who always has been, is personal. He's my shepherd. He's your shepherd. He's our shepherd. And when you personalize that, as David did, then there's something that happens in your soul. There's something that begins to take place in your life. And strength manifests in your life. Jehovah Sidkenu. Isn't that a fun name? Ever say Sidkenu? Almost sounds like an Indian name, doesn't it? I have a friend, uh, he's been here several times, Pastor Rich Fennell, and uh, he's uh, fair-skinned, red on the head, and now a little bit more gray than, than, than red, like uh, does happen in life. And he has a, uh, uh, he has a, when he uh, lives in North Carolina, so North Carolina is a, a beautiful part of the country, uh, but not more pretty than Iowa, and I tell him that all the time, and, and it, he, uh, he has an uh, Indian name when he goes out golfing. And his Indian name is Shade Seeker. Shade Seeker. <laughs> and because uh, he doesn't want to get burned. And so we'll be somewhere and, you know, he's got these great big hats. He looks like a gardener out on the, uh, on the golf course. And he's just a lot of fun to be with. And, uh, but, you know, when you're fair-skinned and you like being outdoors, you know, he gave himself an Indian name, Shade Seeker, and so we, we like that. But Jehovah said, Canoe, the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23 is a chapter in which Jeremiah begins to prophesy to the people of God because they had horrible shepherds, people that were exploiting the sheep, taking advantage of the sheep, not caring for the sheep, neglecting the sheep, abusing the sheep, all of the bad things that a shepherd should never be associated with. 
So in the midst of all of this junk that's happening between those that should be leading, guiding, protecting all the good qualities of shepherd, uh, the people are experiencing just the opposite. And so Jeremiah begins to prophesy, the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he begins to speak and say that God is a righteous God and will raise up a shepherd for them that will come out of the root of David. He's prophesying about Jesus. And, and, and from this prophecy, there was a promise that man would be given a shepherd that would make them righteous. And then in 1 Corinthians 1.30, which is the supportive verse in the New Testament, it says, God has made unto us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, that's an amazing truth. God has made unto us. The word made is, is very important. Because it was God's initiating. Man couldn't make himself righteous. We couldn't redeem ourselves. And there's no way that, uh, uh, you know, in our own works or abilities that we could ever come to a place where we weren't dealing with guilt or regret or condemnation. And because man's inability to make himself righteous, because our righteousness falls short of the glory of God, God sent His only begotten Son who became our sin for us so that we become the righteousness of God in Christ. He made unto us righteousness and redemption and sanctification. This is something that God initiated through Jesus Christ and everyone who has accepted Christ is righteous before God. The other word that's a parallel word with righteousness in the New Testament is the word justification. They're similar. They have some differences, but they have more in common. I like one definition that I heard as a teenager of the word justification. When a man or a woman comes to faith in Christ, they're cleansed from all sin, made righteous or justified before the Lord because of their faith in Christ, and justification could be defined as just as if I'd never sinned. So where's guilt? Where's condemnation? Where's regret? Washed away with the righteous work of Christ. He became what we were. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 that we might be made the righteousness of God, how? In Christ Jesus. But this was first revealed unto the nation of Israel when in a time people were disconnected from God, living apart from God, and had horrible leadership in their life that were not encouraging them to repent nor to return to the Lord. So Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, prophesied about the one who would come and make all wrongs right, Jesus. That's why he gets the glory. The last one, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. This is a great story in the book of Ezekiel. This is the last part of the book uh, of, of Ezekiel, last part of his prophecy. And Ezekiel is one of these Old Testament prophets that sort of transcends generations and dispensations and times in that Ezekiel saw the city of God. He saw the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven and the place that we will be eternally with the Lord. And, and he began to describe it and prophesy about it. And this is the end of the prophecy as you get to the last verse of the last chapter of the book of Ezekiel. And this is the way the Lord revealed himself in that place, in that city to his people. I am present. I am there. Woo! Who doesn't want to be there in his presence, in his city? And that's all been, been made available because of Jesus Christ. 
the companion scripture is Hebrews 13, 5, where God makes a promise. And if God makes a promise out of his nature, he will keep it if we will do our part. Of course, he will always do his. He's looking to work with us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many of you have read this in the Amplified Bible? Have you ever read this portion of Scripture in the Amplified? What is amplified in that particular verse? What word is amplified? I will not, I will not in any way, shape, form, or fashion ever leave or forsake you. It speaks of two aspects of God's faithfulness in that promise. Leave is physically. I will never leave you. Forsake is emotionally. You will never be alone emotionally. When someone feels forsaken, they feel abandoned, discarded. And God revealed himself through Ezekiel in this wonderful picture of eternity where we were all destined to be because of Jesus. And that's why he will get the glory. And he said, I, I am Jehovah. I am the existing God, self-existing. I am the beginning and the end. I am unchanging, unwavering. I don't vary in any way, shape, fashion, or form. I am always who I am. I will always be who I am. I will always be true to my names because they reveal my nature, and this is who I am. And God, in seven redemptive names, compound redemptive names, which just means compound means you put two and it makes one. Jehovah, and then you put the name. Jehovah meaning God, ever present, ever existing, always there. And then who he is through this. And you begin to interact with him in this way. You begin to invite him into your life in this manner. You begin to trust him in these situations then he shows himself to be exactly who he always has been. I want to finish by reading one other portion of Scripture. Are you guys ready? Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the same as Jesus in the New Testament. How do I know that? Well, there's multitudes of scripture that teach that, but let's look at what the writer of the book of Hebrews says. God, who at various ways and in various, excuse me, various times and in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angel as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Verse 3 gives us such a wonderful truth that we can hang our hat on with it when it comes to our faith. Speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, here's the next expression, the express image of his person, identical. Um, one man said, if you want to know what God the Father is like, just look at God the Son. He's the express image of the Father. He came to do the will of the Father he spoke the will of the Father. He fulfilled the will of the Father. And the name of his Father is Jehovah. The name of the Son is Jesus. And they are one. So since the Lord is our provider and our banner, our physician, our peace, our righteousness, and is always with us in the Old Testament, wouldn't he be that and so much more in Jesus in the New Testament? Amen. Who is God? He's exactly who he says he is. What will he do? Exactly what he said he will do. How do I know that? His names reveal his will, his nature, and it's all documented. When did he show up? Exactly when he needed to. And for what reason? To reveal himself to his people. And what did that do? It gave them assurance and confidence. 
who is God and what do you need him to do in your life? Well, you've learned a little bit more about him, hopefully this morning, or been stirred up along those lines. But have you personalized that recently? Have you said he is those things and so much more? Or are you still trying to carry the load, the burden, the weight? Still trying to figure or logically come to a conclusion that you'll never come to a really, what I would say, is a satisfactory, uh, you'll never be satisfied with the logical end of your thinking? Wouldn't it be better to say, God, I trust in you. I believe in you. I can rely on you. I can adhere to you because of who you are. And you're bigger than my logic. And in my struggles and concerns and anxieties, you are still with me. You don't forsake me. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.